Okay. Uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. Okay. Uh, happy Sabbath and welcome to GCA Church. Uh, it's a great day to worship God. Uh, we're really glad that you're here. Okay, so next weekend uh, is a very special weekend. There will be a bunch of Christmas programs from the various groups. On Friday evening, Testify will be doing their first program at 7.30 p.m. And the next day, Sabbath, uh, Camerod and Corral will be performing in during church. And Saturday evening, the instrumental groups will be presenting their annual Christmas concert also. Uh, any of these programs will be excellent to invite your friends and neighbors to. Midweek, midweek next week will be caroling, so come join them on the 6th at 7 p.m. for Christmas caroling, and it does count for community service, and meet at the GCA parking lot. And if you are able to wrap presents at, for our Gordon Hospital on the evening of December 4th, from 3.30 to 8.30, contact Pastor Greg. Uh, we need three, two to three people at a time to help wrap for families being helped by Gordon Hospital. And they're hoping to have several people to do shifts. All right, so this is, the, this is a book on sale for the Pathfinders. Uh, there's one in the foyer if you'd like to look at it. You can buy these, and the money is going to Pathfinders because they're fundraising for I'm guessing trips and things. Uh, yeah, so now a member of Testify has an announcement. The best story that can be told is the story of Jesus. And uh, that is because of the impact that it has on the lives of those who hear it, uh, the relevance to all of us, and uh, our need for that story. And every year uh, at this time of year, all over the world, in churches, in schools, in various places, that story is told. And sadly, a lot of times when that story is told, it is met with yawns, polite claps, some boredom. And I believe that is because we hear it so many times, the same story every year, uh, that we become a little bit desensitized to the wonder and majesty and power and phenomenal life-changing effect that that story can have. Um, I, I suppose there's a lot of solutions to deal with that, um, whether that is uh, digging into the story or getting to know some of the details of the story, um, uncovering the people, the places, the stories within the stories. Um, I think the biggest impact, though, we can have when we're trying to change that is to figure out what about that story is what God is trying to tell us personally. Um, all of that I'm saying uh, because I want to invite you to come next Friday night. Um, we're going to tell that story. Uh, but we're telling it from the pen of a woman who wrote that, about that story many, many years ago, um, over 100 years ago. Um, when Ellen White wrote The Desire of Ages, I'm sure she had some idea of the impact that that book would have on the lives of so many. I know me personally, um, it is with, next to the Bible, the most important book I've read um, in my Christian faith. And so um, when we tell this story um, next Friday night, we're not telling the traditional, we're tell, talking about the wise men, and we're not telling the traditional wise man story, we're not telling the Hollywood uh, animated kids version. We're telling it as God inspired her to write it. And that is a story of a God who calls people from all over the earth, pagans, heathens, not necessarily the chosen. And he calls them, and he's a God who loves them. And that's the story that we're going to tell next Friday night for Vespers. And I hope that you can come. And I hope that in that story, you will find the story that God has for your life and um, what he is trying to tell you about how much he loves you. Thank you. Christmas is about family. Uh, we are a church family. We talk about the GCA church family that exists to capture the hearts and minds of young people and to develop them into fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and one thing that's important for families to do is to, to talk and to share. Christmas time, we often talk about making a list 
about what we want to get for Christmas. But today I want you to think not about what you want to get, but maybe there's something you're really excited about giving. So we're going to take a little moment here, and I want you to maybe get up and, and find somebody on, in a different section than you're sitting, and uh, I want you to share with them something that you are excited about giving to someone else this Christmas. Now make sure you're not finding the person that you're getting that gift for. You know, you want it to be a pr surprise yet. But let's take just a moment and uh, go find somebody and tell them what you are excited about giving this Christmas season. Let's uh, come back to our seats and be awaiting the, the gift that others are giving us through the gifts that God has given them. I just want to uh, express thanks for a gift of time that was given uh, by the Siglers, Nick and Heidi, who have spent some many hours decorating our church for Christmas, so thank you for that gift. And uh, thank all our musicians and all our participants for the gifts that they are sharing today. If you walk into our house, there's a wall in our kitchen that's painted in chalkboard paint. And on that chalkboard paint is a calendar. And on that calendar, every month, my wife and I stand in front of it, and we divide up our, our month. With her working two jobs here at GCA and at Floyd Hospital, with supervision schedules, meetings, three boys to take to doctor's offices and appointments, and now we have the added school plays. It's important for us just to keep our sanity to do this every month, and we do it. And of course, yesterday was the first of the month, and so we looked at it, and we stood in front of it, and we planned it out, 
And there's a Christmas parade in Calhoun. There's Christmas programs. That's plural, programs. There are things that we have to get uh, pictures for. There's travel plans. All these things look up at us every day as we walk by so we can plan out our, our month. And in this time where we should be bringing the sense of joy and peace, I'm more inundated with a sense of exhaustion. Because the season seems to be people chasing after this idea of a perfect Christmas. But I think the devil really wants us to do that. Because when we're going to all of these wonderful holiday things, we miss out on the true meaning of Christmas. We miss out on what it's actually all about, and that is a promise fulfilled, a Savior given. And so today, it is our desire here in worship that you put all of those other various and sundry things aside, and you remember what the true meaning of Christmas is. It's not about the lights. It's not about the parades. It's really not even about the music. But what it is about is a Savior that has come and wrapped himself in humanity to save each and every one of you. May your worship service be blessed today.
God has with us. Father God, I thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the Christmas season and all the joy that it brings. God, I, um, I pray that you be with us in this service today. Help us to receive a blessing. Help us to search for you in everything that we do. We love you so much. In your name I pray, amen. At this time, um, it is time for children's story. So kids, go walk around and collect any dollar bills that you see out and bring it up to the church. And Miss Brittany has our story today. Good morning. Can anybody tell me why we're all dressed in red and green? Is it a special time of year? What is it? For Christmas. That's right. You know what? I want to tell you a little story about the first Christmas present I ever gave to somebody. I can remember my first gift that I ever gave. It was to my mom. I was so excited. I went to the store with my dad because I couldn't go by myself yet, and I'm sure he paid for it, but I picked it out. I found something. I was so excited to give my mom, and I took it home, and I wrapped it all by myself. I got this nice big box, and I put my present in it, and I wrapped it all myself, and then I had to wait. I had, hi baby, I had to wait until Christmas before my mom could open it and get this awesome present that I got her. And so I waited. I don't know how early I got the present. Maybe I got it a week before since my dad was the one taking me to get it. Maybe it was the day before. Maybe it was a month before, but I had to wait and wait and wait. And then finally Christmas Day came and my mom got to open the present. And she opened this big box and I was so excited and she opened it up. And she dug around inside, and she found nail clippers. Nail clippers, isn't that awesome? It's the coolest gift. Actually, my mom was very excited to get it because she had lost her nail clippers, and I knew that. And so I went to the store, and I got her a new pair. And she was very excited to get a new pair of nail clippers, but she was very excited because it was me that picked it out. And I was the one that wrapped it. And I was the one that was so excited to give it to her. And that's what made it so special for her. This reminds me of the Christmas story. The Christmas story actually started long before Mary and Joseph were born. The Christmas story starts back in the Garden of Eden. Did you know that? Back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They did something that God told them not to do. And because they did that... A curse entered the world, and that was the curse of sin. And the curse of sin brought pain and sadness 
And worst of all, it separated us from God. But God had a plan. God promised that he would send a king. And one day we would have a king to save us from this curse so that we would not have to cry or be in pain anymore and this king would reign forever. And God had promised this. And so a lot of people were waiting for this promise. And there was somebody in Bethlehem who was waiting a long time for this promise. He was in Bethlehem and he was waiting and waiting to see God's promise. And he wanted so badly to be a part of the promise. He wanted to be a part of that. And Mary and Joseph came to Bethlehem and they couldn't find any place to stay. There was no room open. All the hotels were booked. Nothing was available, no place for them to stay. And this innkeeper, he had God in his heart. He had been waiting for the promise. And when he saw Mary and Joseph, he saw that they really needed a place to stay, but all of his rooms were full. But did that stop him? No. Even though he knew all of his rooms were full, he didn't turn them away and say, sorry, go find somebody else. He thought, you know what? Instead of making them go and try to find another place to stay or stay somewhere on the street, I'm going to give them my stable. And a stable doesn't sound like a really great place to stay, does it? No. It's where animals are. It's where they, they eat out of a manger of hay, and that's where the baby was going to have to sleep. It doesn't sound like a great place, but this is what had been foretold in God's promise. And the innkeeper got to be a part of God's promise because he gave what he could. Even though it sounded really small, the innkeeper gave his stable. And that made him a part of God's promise. Do you guys want to be a part of God's promise? Yeah. God's promise was Jesus. He came and he's going to be our king and he will reign forever and he will end the curse. But God also promises that he's going to come back and take us out of this world and bring us home with him. So if you want to be a part of that promise, you just have to keep trusting God, keep God in your heart, and give whatever you can. Even if it seems really small and it does seem, doesn't seem like a big deal, if you give what you have, God uses small things to fulfill his promise, and you can still be a part of his promise. Would somebody like to pray for me today? No? Do you want to pray? Okay, I'll pray then. Please bow your heads. Do you want to pray? All right, come here. Dear, dear, dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Please help us to have a good, good Sabbath. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You can now go back to your seats. Christmas really is a magical time, especially when I see the kids up here in front and I, and I think about how many Christmases they've experienced or how, however many they've even remembered when they think back, you know, the, the time is coming where I can get the gifts that I want and the things that I've been asking for. When I was a kid, I remember uh, my, my grandmother was really good at bringing our family together for some of these major holidays and uh, we had family all over from the Carolinas, to Alberta, Canada, and everywhere in between. And we would meet for a summer for a get-together, and we would actually physically draw names out of a hat for our gift exchange for Christmas. So we would plan way in advance, because we knew we wouldn't see each other in between summer and maybe Christmas time. Maybe Thanksgiving, but that was pretty rare. We got to do three times in one year. And it was always exciting to get to together for Christmas, and you'd, you'd open up the gift, or you'd give that person that you had that, that person's name for, and you give them your gift, and they'd open it, and you get to kind of experience that, the joy of sharing with each other, and it was always a, you know, just a really great memory that I have from growing up. Nowadays, our, uh, we, uh, we subscribe to drawnames.com. Uh, we, we draw names digitally now. We don't have to see each other anymore to get our names uh, drawn out of a hat, this, this virtual hat. You can go on Amazon.com and create a wish list, and then drawnames.com will just pull that wish list over to the, to the draw names thing, and you can just 
click a button and you can buy that gift for that special someone. And then when you show up, you can just say, hey, here's that thing that you specifically asked for and picked on Amazon.com. <clears throat> Uh, we always use Christmas as a stall tactic. We would uh, walk through Walmart like in September, and our kids would beg for the item off that shelf, and we'd say, well, put it on your Christmas list. It's always something that's coming. It's always something that we're looking forward to. But our kids do help us put it in perspective. Um, this, this weekend, we've been uh, decorating the inside of our house. We've already put lights up on the outside, but we've decorating the inside of our, of our house for Christmas. And uh, it, it, I guess it reminds us that, you know, our, our kids, we put on a big show for our kids' birthdays. We make a big deal of it. We, uh, we invite people over, and we have this big, big party. And, um, and to these kids, they're, they're, they're seeing that this is a big celebration, a big party for Jesus' birthday. This is the time that we've chosen to celebrate the, the birth of Christ. Um, and yet we use it to focus on ourselves in so many ways. <clears throat> when you're thinking about what to get others for Christmas, I, I want to encourage you guys to stop and ask yourselves what what's on Jesus's wish list of course he he wants our hearts he wants our commitments but he's also asked for us to give back uh, a part of what he has given us and um, I just want to encourage you to think about that uh, in this Christmas holiday season um, you know the the loose offering uh, today is for the local church budget but our our tithe envelopes always have these little spots that you can fill out if you think if you if there's Something else that's a burden on your heart to give, I encourage you to do so, and, and uh, I, just, I pray that you'll have a wonderful Christmas season. May the deacons please stand. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, thank you so much uh, for the gift of your son, for this season where we can celebrate. Um, it's, it's a magical time for, for our kids to, to just go through this process and enjoy um, celebrating uh, Jesus coming down to this earth. Uh, we can get lost in the busyness and the commercialism of it all. And we ask for your help in just helping us to focus on the true meaning of Christmas. Help us to uh, recognize the blessings that you've given to us. Help us to give back some of those blessings so that it, it continue to be a blessing to others. We thank you and we love you. Amen. Scripture reading today comes from Matthew 1, 18 to 23. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being just a just man was, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall not call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translates God with us. Happy Sabbath. This is the time to come to God in prayer. Please kneel. Dear Jesus, thank you for this Sabbath day and that we can come here to worship you. Bless those who can't be here today. We ask for your spirit to be in us today and through the next week. Please help us as we finish this semester to do well and to stay close to you. Please give us forgiving hearts and forgive us for our sins. Thank you for coming to this earth and for being the reason for this Christmas season. Amen.
bow our heads for our prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we're reminded of the ultimate gift. Lord, help us to accept that. In your name we pray. Amen. Maybe you missed it over the holiday weekend. Uh, Maybe you were too engaged in eating that Thanksgiving food or doing some Black Friday shopping or watching some football or spending time with family or making your way through all the traffic to come back to school. Maybe you missed it, but on Black Friday last week, there was something that went for sale on the Kentucky Fried Chicken website. Did you even know Kentucky Fried Chicken had a website? Let's see that. It is the Internet Escape Pod with Colonel Sanders on top. Go to the next picture there, a little bit closer up. Uh, What this is, is a steel frame tent, uh, a pod, Uh, complete with a drumstick on the door handle. I think we have a picture of that. And uh, the purpose of this internet escape pod is for you to be able to go in and escape from the internet. Go to the next, you know, you can get in there with a couple friends with a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And while you're in there, Wi-Fi cannot reach you. While you are in there, uh, your cell phone will not ring because it's specifically designed to block all of these things. It is a modern day cone of silence. And it went for sale on the Kentucky Fried Chicken website, complete with the kernel, for a cool $10,000. I couldn't couldn't find if anybody actually purchased this, um, but maybe some people wanted to escape from the messages of the world. Have you ever done that? Have you ever purposely put yourself in a situation where you would miss important messages? You know, your phone rings, and you look at it, and it says, warning, don't answer this. You know, it's it's the salesperson, it's uh, whatever. Uh, You don't recognize the number, so you don't answer, and you'll, you'll call them back later, screening those calls, specifically missing a message. Could it be that we sometimes miss the most important message. Could it be that even as we hear this Christmas story, as Mrs. Scott already mentioned this morning, it's a story that that we know. Even people who who don't really believe the Bible have heard about shepherds and, and wise men and Bethlehem and a manger. We sung this morning, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And we sing that every Christmas. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And this December, our series that we're looking at, we're kind of focusing on the messages of Christmas. Hark. What does that mean? That word hark means listen or pay attention. Something good is about to come. And could it be that in this Christmas season, we are missing the important message that God is trying to send us? And so this December, uh, we've got today, next week is the Festival of Carols. I'm looking forward to that. And then it's home leave, and I know many of you are looking forward to that. But as we continue through this month, we're going to be looking at the messages and the messengers uh, of the Christmas season. And I hope that you will be challenged 
to not only hear the messages, but to respond to the messages. So today we're going to look at one messenger and one message that is given to two people, and yet I think the message is for the whole world. So we're going to start today in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, we're going to find the first messenger and the first message that we're going to look at. Luke chapter 1 and verse 26, it says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now we want, got to take care of a couple little uh, contextual things here. It said in the sixth month, that is the sixth month since uh, the angel Gabriel had appeared to Zacharias and, and announced that John the Baptist was going to be born. Now this is six months later. And it says he appeared in the city of Nazareth, a small town, uh, not the capital city, uh, not the big city. Uh, we were actually had the opportunity to be there last summer. It's, it's, on a, it's on a hill. When we came into Nazareth, a bus parked, and we had to get out and walk up windy stone streets to the top of the hill where there is now a church, and that church is supposedly built over the site of the home of Mary and Joseph. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but that was the place where the angel Gabriel appeared. And it said that uh, appeared to a, a young lady who was betrothed. Now that's a, a, a fancy word we don't use very much, but it basically means engaged. And it doesn't just mean, okay, we're going to get married. It means there's a legal there's a legal involvement that takes place. It's, it's more than a typical engagement that we have. Uh, but it's a legal engagement without some of the, uh, the, the, the benefits of marriage. And that is where Gabriel came. Now I said we're talking about the messenger and the message. And verse 26 specifically says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God. Now in scripture, angels show up quite a bit. The word angel simply means messenger. And when angels show up in the Bible, uh, they're sometimes giving a message from God. They're sometimes giving protection to God's people. Sometimes they're directing people where they need to go. They're, they're rescuing people from prison. They are even pouring out the judgments of God sometimes, because that is a message that is sometimes given. And, and we see that, that these angels are, are, they're not human. They're not God. They're created beings. And, and we don't quite fully understand what they are. But in this case, we see an angel with a particular name, Gabriel, that appears to Mary. Now Gabriel, as I just said, in this chapter, had already appeared to Zacharias. He appears here to Mary. Uh, I think we're going to see in just a moment that he probably appeared to Joseph. And in the New Testament, um, according to the book Desire of Ages, it is the angel Gabriel who is by Jesus' side during his time on earth. It is the angel Gabriel who is, strengthens Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before Jesus goes to the cross. It is Gabriel who goes to the tomb and rolls the stone away. And it is Gabriel who says to, to Jesus, dying dead inside the tomb, he says, come forth. But that's, that's still in the future from this story. But if we were to go back, 500 years, you've got the angel Gabriel appearing again, appearing to a prophet named Daniel. 500 years before, Gabriel is specifically named as the angel who appears to Daniel and says uh, that the Messiah is coming. And in fact, he lays out a timetable so that the people of God, had they studied it, had they paid attention, they would know that the Messiah was soon to come. And now, 500 years later, the same angel who proclaimed that the Messiah is coming comes to Mary and says, guess what? The time is here. The time is now. The Messiah is about to be born. I think that's pretty awesome. And so the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, and we look at verse 28. And it says, having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And this uh, freaked Mary out a little bit. 
as it would. If an angel appeared to you, it would, easy, it would be easy to be freaked out. Because usually when angels show up uh, in the Bible, the people are afraid, they're terrified. In fact, when an angel appeared to John in the book of Revelation, there's a, a couple places where John is so overwhelmed that he actually falls down and begins to worship the angel. And the angel says, whoa, whoa, brother, brother, no, no, you, you, not me. I'm just a messenger. I'm just a servant like you. Don't worship me. Worship God. So Mary is troubled by this presence. Mary is troubled perhaps by this greeting that she gets. And oftentimes we focus on the greeting because we want to prove other people wrong. Uh, and so we, we spend a lot of time talking about the greeting that Mary received. But it's really a greeting. That's not the point of the message of the angel. In verse 30, we begin to see the message from Gabriel. Verse 30, it says, Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. This is the first part of the message. Don't be afraid. I know this is overwhelming. I know you're not certain of what is about to happen, but fear not. Don't be afraid. But even that is not yet the message. Here's the message. Verse 31 Here's the message. It says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And then in verse 33, it says, He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no man. And so that is the message that you will conceive and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Now that name, Jesus, is a Greek name. The message, the name in the Old Testament is, is Joshua. And that name simply means Yahweh saves. It was a common name. There were lots of people named Jesus. There were lots of people named Joshua because there were lots of people looking forward to this Messiah, hoping that Messiah would come. Yahweh saves. But that's not the end of the message. Because Mary, she's not married yet, she's betrothed, and, and she's not sure how this, this works. And she says, how can this be? I've not yet uh, known a man. She says, angel, that, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. What are you talking about, angel? And Gabriel responds again in verse 35, and it says, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will also be called the Son of God. So we've seen an angel that says, fear not. We've seen, we see an angel that talks about Jesus coming as a Savior. And we see an angel proclaiming that, that the power of God is going to be at work in this. It doesn't say we're going to understand it. It doesn't even say Mary is going to understand it. The angel doesn't pull out an AMP book and try to describe how this is going to be. He just proclaims that the power of God is going to be at work and something miraculous is going to take place. And think about this. Jesus, a part of the Godhead, is in heaven. And the angel says, no, you are going to leave the glories of heaven and you're going to come into uh, the, the womb of a woman. You're going to become a, a, a zygote. Got a little picture of that. A zygote is, a, is, is one cell that contains the DNA of who a person is going to be. So in this one cell contains all the genetic data of both God and man. And it's going to be implanted. It's going to be placed into Mary. And, and this fragile little cell is, is God and man. The, the, the term is similar to in Genesis 1 verse 2. Genesis 1 verse 2 says that the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. The Holy Spirit hovered over creation and the power of God was at work. And in, this is the same situation. The power of God is going to be at work in the life of Mary. 
And so this message of Gabriel is, is don't fear. The power of God is going to be at work in your life. And then you're going to have a son. You're going to call him Jesus because he's going to be the Savior. So, so kind of a three-part message. Don't fear because the power of God is, a, is about to be at work in your life. And you're going to see that power played out through this Savior, Jesus. So we can turn over to, to Matthew and we basically see the same message given to somebody else in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. So flip back just a couple pages to the very first chapter of the New Testament. And in verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. That's what we just talked about. That's the story from Luke. Have you ever wondered when Mary told Joseph what was up? Did she tell him as soon as the angel came to her? Did she, did she tell him after it became evident that she was pregnant? Um, because maybe she hadn't fully understood or believed it until that point. Did, did she wait until that first baby bump began to show and, and there was nowhere to hide, there was nothing to say? I don't know when she told him. But uh, apparently, at first at least, Joseph didn't quite believe the story because it says that Joseph uh, was an honorable man. He was a just man. He knew that he didn't have anything to do with this. He didn't want to, uh, to put Mary in a bad place, but he also didn't want to be uh, married to her anymore. And so he, he went to legally break this off without making a big uh, ruckus about it. And as he's pondering this, as he's making a decision about what to do, it says in verse 20, while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So it's a little different this time. It's in a dream. In Luke, uh, the angel comes directly to Mary, but this time, as God sometimes works, he's, he's working through a dream. And it doesn't say it specifically here, but I think it's the same angel. I think it's the same messenger because it's the same message that's given to two people, but I think the message is for the whole world. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Hmm, we've heard that before. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the power of God is at work. Don't be afraid because the power of God is at work. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. It's the same message. Don't be afraid because the power of God is at work in this situation, and there's going to be a Savior, Jesus Christ, and he's going to save the people from their sins. It's the same message that Mary received. Joseph received it. Mary received it. And could it be that 2,000 years later, it's a message that, that we need to receive? Could it be that we need to listen to this message in our life this year, this month, this week? What were the three parts of that message? First of all, Gabriel had said, don't fear. Mary and Joseph both had reasons to be afraid. Their, their reputation was on the line. Mary could have been accused of adultery and her very life could have been on the line. Um, th they had reasons to be afraid. And if we look at our life, if we look at the situation in our life, guess what? We still have a reason to be afraid. We look at the news and we see stories of missiles being launched. Uh, we read about conflict in society uh, day after day, there's shocking news stories about this person who has lied and this person who has done this. In our personal lives, uh, the stress and anxiety is, is, gets higher and higher as students. You face uh, finals at, at the job. You face end of the year things. And, and all of this builds up and the anxiety and the stress is there. In our personal life, we see relationships that are struggling, relationships that are in fact broken. And I think that we still need to hear this message of don't be afraid, of fear not. Because as we look at our life, 
there are many, many things to be afraid of. But if we just left the message there, fear not, it wouldn't answer any questions. But the message goes on, fear not, because the power of God is going to be at work. It says, if, if we were to continue on in Matthew, it says, uh, quoting from the Old Testament, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. The Apostle John, in John chapter 1, uses a different phraseology. He says the word, Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Apostle Paul describes it a little differently. I want to turn there to Philippians chapter 2. The book of Philippians in the middle of the New Testament. Philippians chapter 2. And Paul is uh, writing to this church in Philippi. And he starts in verse 5 and he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Think like Jesus. Who being in the form of God, so Jesus was in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant or the form of a slave and coming in the likeness of men. So God became man and the power of God became at work in this earth. Emmanuel, God with us, the word became flesh and this was needed. Jesus needed to be like me. Jesus needed to uh, be able to get the flu. Jesus needed to be able to sprain his ankle. Jesus needed to be able to get a blister, to get tired, to get sunburned. Jesus needed to be like us, to be human. Because humanity needed something outside of itself. Because we look at our world and it seems like it's getting better and better. We think of technology that's advancing. Um, in our pockets, we have devices that we can connect with anyone in the world. We've got people living up on a space station in outer space right now. We've got cars that run on electricity. And yet this world still has people that are at war. This world still has people that, uh, that, that kill each other, that speak ill of each other, that don't show love to each other. This world is still a mess. The Old Testament says uh, there is a way that seems right to a man, to a human, but in the end, it leads to death. We need something outside of this world. And God said, guess what? The power of God is going to be at work. Don't be afraid because the power of God is entering this world. And then the third part of that message was that there would be a child, Jesus. You shall call him Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. And we look at Philippians 2, we continue there in verse 8. In verse 7 it said he came in the likeness of men. Verse 8 it says being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You know there are many people around the world that talk about Jesus as a good man, as a moral teacher. He said nice things about how we should treat each other, about how we should love each other. And the sayings of Jesus are placed by the sayings of Buddha, are placed by the sayings of Bono. And Jesus is a good person and a good teacher. But the message of Gabriel, the message of Christmas, is that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. And that's the message of the cross. We look at the world around us and it seems often that it's a world of chaos and we don't like to admit it that while there's chaos out there, perhaps there's also chaos in our own life because we are still sinners. We still need a savior and that's why Jesus came because we still need a savior. How did these two people respond when Mary heard the message in, in Luke 138, she said, let it be according to your word. Angel, what you say, let, let's go. Let's make it happen. In Matthew chapter 1, it says that when Joseph heard this word, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. They heard this message, fear not, 
The power of God is going to be at work, and you're going to see the Savior of the world come into this world. They were both ready to accept this message and move on in their life. That's why we talk about it year after year when December comes. What about you? How will you respond to this message? You know, Christmas can be an expensive thing sometimes. Uh, I've heard some people recently who said, you know what, we're not, we're not buying presents anymore. We're just going to make it a family time. Christmas can be expensive as we, you know, buy banquet dresses, ladies, anybody experiencing that? Uh, baking, you're doing more extra baking. Um, you've got presents to buy. You've got decorations and lights. There's a company uh, that has come up year after year with the CPI, the Christmas Price Index. And what they do with this Christmas price index is that they take the gifts that are given in an old song, the 12 days of Christmas. I think we got a slide with the different 12 days of Christmas there, the numbers that are up there. You know this song? The partridge in the pear tree, uh, two turtle doves, three French hens, four calling birds, and of course, five gold. Yeah, you know the song. You may not remember the rest of those because they get a little confusing. But the Christmas price index year after year tallies up what it would cost to buy all these gifts for your true love. Unfortunately, the price has gone up about a half a percent, 0.6 percent this year. Um, and that price increase has, uh, is mainly due because of the higher cost of the, the, the pear trees. They've gone up a little bit. The gold is worth a little bit more, so those five golden rings are going to cost you a little bit more. And there's been a 2% increase in the salary for the 10 lords of leaping. So that's where the, most of the price increase has come. So if you had a true love that you truly loved and wanted to buy all of these gifts of the 12 days of Christmas, it would be $34,558.65. Don't forget that 65 cents. $35,000. Christmas can be expensive, even if we're not getting the 12 days of Christmas. But the, the things that we purchase, the presents that we get, the people that we are around, what is that value based on? If I was to bring home eight maids of milking, I don't think my true love would appreciate that very much. What is the value based on. About two or three weeks ago, in the middle of November, there was an auction that took place in New York, an art auction. Um, and there were some big prices on some of these pieces of art. There was one by an artist by the name of Cy Twombly, which, excuse my ignorance, I've never heard of him, but Cy Twombly had an untitled piece of art. Let's see that first one. I think the third grade you know, art class down at Coble could, uh, could handle that. But that piece of art sold for $46 million <laughs> two weeks ago in New York. It was untitled. It's bizarre. And yet somebody was willing to spend $46 million. There was another piece of art there, the Salvatore Mundi. Let's see that one. It's about two feet by a little bit less than two feet. It's uh, hard to see even if you're looking at it up close, but it's a picture of Jesus. And he's holding a globe, like a glass orb in his hand. And uh, this piece of art was sold like back in the 50s for about 60 bucks. Uh, 60 bucks. Because uh, they thought it was a, a replica, a copy. And over the years, this piece of art has been damaged. Uh, water, the elements, it's been painted over, poorly restored. Uh, but a, a few years ago, the experts, whoever they are, as they studied this, they decided, you know what? This isn't a duplicate. This isn't a copy. This is an original. This is an original painting by Leonardo da Vinci. That's what some of the experts say. Some of them still say, no, I, don't, I don't buy it. I don't think it is. This is the only... Da Vinci, which is not in a museum. It was privately owned. Um, 
and it was coming for sale. It, was, it sat in New York City. That's where the auction was. And New York does not have a Da Vinci painting anywhere in the town. So it was on display and the people lined up. To see, let's leave that painting up there to, to see this painting. And uh, the auction came. Somebody had already dropped $46 million on the Twombly painting. So they may not have been bidding on this. But before the bidding was over for this two foot by two foot painting... It sold for $450 million, the most expensive piece of art ever sold. Where do we put our value? As I look at this, I could see, I could see two different things. Uh, I, I could see that um, what are we willing to spend on, on Jesus? You know, if somebody thinks a painting of Jesus is worth $450 million, what is the person of Jesus actually worth to me? It's not about money, but is it about time? Is it about my attitude towards him? What is Jesus worth to me? But then I looked at this from the, the other direction. And I see one painting, untitled, that's bizarre and uh, you know, unheard of, unknown. Have you ever felt bizarre? Have you ever felt unheard of, unknown? And then this painting, which is damaged, which somebody tried to restore and did a horrible job. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt in your life that, that you are damaged goods because of your attitude, because of the actions, because of the things that you have done in your life? And maybe you've tried to fix it yourself, you've tried to restore it yourself, but it just makes it look worse. And people are like, no, 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 I, I, I don't see the, the image of the master there anywhere. And yet, somebody looks at you, God looks at you, Jesus looks at you, and says, okay, that's, that person's bizarre. They're unknown, nobody cares about them, but I care about them. Yeah, that person's done, made some mistakes, they're messed up, and they've tried to fix it, and they just made it worse. But guess what? I still care about them. And I'm not going to spend $46 million or $450 million. No, I'm going to come down there. And I'm going to give my life so that they can be with me, so that I can show them the value that they have in their life. We are sinners. We are worthless. The image of God is marred. And yet God saw value in his creation. And he was willing to give his life. He was willing to pay the ultimate price for you and for me. Don't fear. Because the power of God is at work in your life. And Jesus is the Savior of the world. In just a moment, I'm going to invite some of you to come up and have a prayer. We don't, we don't do this very often. In just a moment, we're going to sing a little song. Because this is, this is kind of our last Sabbath together. This is our last sermon before the end of, of the year, believe it or not, before 2018 rolls around. And maybe there's some here who hear that message and the angel says, don't be afraid. And maybe as you look at your life, there's some things in your life that you've been afraid of. You've been afraid of taking a step with Jesus. You've been afraid of, of, of following Jesus fully. Maybe you're afraid of the, the, what your friends will say. Maybe you're afraid of what your boss will say. Maybe you're afraid of what's going to happen in your life, decisions that you're going to make. And maybe it's time to say, God, I hear that message. I'm not going to be afraid anymore. I'm going to stand up for you. And that second part of the message is about the power of God in your life. And maybe you just need to pour out a plea to God because you need to see the power of God in your life. Maybe there, there's something, there's a, a sickness, there's an, an attitude, there, there's an addiction which has a hold of you and, and you've tried to get rid of it and you can't. And the only way that, that you see anything changing is that the, the power of God is going to show up. The Holy Spirit is going to show up in your life. And maybe in just a moment, you're going to come up and you're just going to pray silently, God, I'm giving you this thing. Take it. I need the power of God in my life. And that final message was about Jesus who came to save his people from their sins. And even though we gather here every Sabbath, 
Even though there's, there's Bible classes and midweek services and family worships that take place, maybe you haven't accepted Jesus as, as your Savior. You've talked about him. We've sung about him. We've done skits about him. But have you accepted him in your life? I'm going to borrow this guitar right over here. Is it Desiree's? Is that all right? We're going to sing just a, a little chorus, a short little chorus. And as we do, I just want to invite those that are in those three categories. Maybe you've been afraid of standing up for God. You don't want to be afraid anymore. As we sing, just come forward. Maybe you need the power of God in your life. Plead for it. Pray for it. And maybe, just maybe, you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We're going to sing just a little chorus. You know it. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us He alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy. Christ alone. We'll give him all the glory. Heavenly Father, we can adore you. We stand before you. Lord, maybe we're in need of courage because we've been afraid to stand for you. God, give us that courage. Help us to fear not. Don't be afraid of what others are going to say about us, but just come to you. And God, maybe there's that challenge in our life and we just can't get rid of it. But Lord, we plead for the power of God the power of the Holy Spirit to, to make a difference, to make a change in our life. Lord, open us up. We don't know what that's going to look like, but work in our life. And Lord, there's some who have, who have never taken a stand for you. There's some who have, who have never been through the waters of baptism. There's some who have never proclaimed you as the Lord of their life, as the Savior of their life. And Lord, they do that now. God, help us to come to you each and every day. Help us to adore you each and every day. In your name we pray, amen.